Hello and welcome back to Radio Rothbard. I'm Ryan McMakin. I'm a senior editor at the Mises Institute. And joining me today is Tho Bishop, our associate editor. It's April 15th, and uh, we decided to cover a little controversy that uh, occurred recently on the Tucker Carlson show and on Twitter. And this has to do with uh, immigration, which is always one of the funnest things to talk about because people are really worked up about it uh, on both sides. And before we just do anything else, though, why don't you just explain to our listeners what it is that we're talking about? Because I'm sure some of these people uh, have lives and they're not following every little thing on Twitter or Tucker, and they could probably use a, a, a brief explanation. So so what is it we're, that we're talking about? Well, the left is trying to, to cancel Tucker Carlson yet again, which... Uh... Is, is usually a sign that he's, he's doing something right. But I, I think that there is something, there, there's an interesting at the argument here uh, with some nuance that, that uh, I think a lot of other outlets can't provide. So basically what happened is that last week uh, when Tucker Carlson was doing a segment on another Fox show, uh, I, I think the conversation came up on uh, how the Biden administration was trying to give certain, uh, it was not requiring illegal immigrants to have the same sort of identification as American citizens. And Tucker Carlson was making the point that, you know, here is yet another example of how the American government gives certain privileges to non-citizens while uh, ratcheting up control over the citizens themselves. And he went on to basically say that, you know, this is a, a deliberate political scheme uh, with the goal being demographic change. Um, and, and, and of course, this made all the usual suspects on Twitter go crazy, calling Tucker Carlson a white nationalist, saying, oh, well, this is the, the you know, white genocide theory or white replacement theory and all, all that sort of stuff. And um, then he followed up on Monday with a much longer sort of takedown. Again, the idea being that, you know, it's an interesting sort of political science argument that, you know, by allowing open borders and, and increasing immigration levels in the U.S., um, that you are devaluing the political power of American citizens. And again, the, the larger point here was that this is a deliberate political plot by the Democratic Party to remake the demographics of the United States, to then change the voting patterns of the United States to give long-lasting power to a certain party. And of course, they're making examples of what has happened in California and how it went from being the state of Nixon and Reagan to the state of uh, Gavin Newsom and, and John Brown. And, and I, you know, I, one of the things I think is interesting here, and, and of course, this is something that's come up a lot in recent years, is you've seen it through uh, you know, Europe and some of the issues they've had with immigration from uh, Middle Eastern countries uh, as a result of wars, uh, particularly those suffering from American intervention. And, and I, I think that it's 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 a topic that I think is personally interesting because I, I do think that um, you know a, a lot of libertarians sort of make a mistake on on ignoring nationality at all as a question. I mean, this is something that Mises addressed. It's something that Rothbard addressed in the '90s. Nation by consent, I think, is one of his most profound uh, the political articles out there. It's you know you've touched on some of the themes there in some of your work, um, but it's it's interesting because I, I think that. Tucker is putting all of the political kind of the, 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 the really stressing that immigration is the cause for like the left political change in America. And yet I think it's, it's particularly fascinating after the 2020 election where you know, a lot of the high immigrant Hispanic populations actually tended much stronger for Trump. Um, and meanwhile, the largest demographic pushing the America kind of leftward is, is often the college educated, particularly post-college edu or post-graduate educated white liberal voters. And so I, I think that there is a room here for an honest conversation between, okay, what are the political consequences of immigration? What does nationality and, and demographic changes, you know, what, 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 what are the real impacts there? And is this the de facto mechanism for also, is this a deliberate political strategy from the left? And is this the main cause for American going uh, being moved to the left? And, and I think that it is since we have this tendency to 
bring questions like this into either one of two polarizing camps, either one talking about this at all is taboo racism or one like, oh, well, this is so self-evidently obvious. And that if you dare question uh, the, the, you know, suicide of the West narrative that, you know, you're, you're a blind, you know, whatever. I, I, I think that a, an Austrian lens and, and building on the work of, of Mises and Rothbard, we can have kind of a unique uh, substantive conversation here, kind of perhaps uh, outlining some of the nuances within these topics. Well, let's break down here. I think there's a few components of what Tucker's saying here uh, that aren't all the same, that there's heterogeneous points here. So uh, the first point, of course, is that there's, there's this effort to change the demographic makeup of the country. And I think on that, he's correct. That's point one, right? There's an effort. That seems to be the plan. Whether that's a good plan or well-thought-out plan is something else entirely, because that brings us to the second part of it, this assumption that on both sides, really, that the quote-unquote importation, uh, as if these weren't people who were just simply deciding themselves to move across the border— were our reliable drivers of some sort of left-wing agenda. And that they're really the core of it. And for for example, the idea that the reason California is far left now is because immigrants moved there. And so the, the notion on both sides, it seems, because Tucker seems to, to believe this idea too, that America has this pristine, if it weren't for if it weren't for immigrants moving here, America would have this pristine Anglo-Saxon culture where everyone was a laissez-faire, hardcore, radical, uh, Gustav de Molinari type, uh, free market person. Uh, although in Tucker's case, that's going too far because Tucker himself is constantly denouncing free markets and whining about capitalists. Uh, so I'm not quite sure what he thinks there, but clearly... If it weren't for these non-white people, everybody would be red-blooded Americans who love freedom, however that's defined. And uh, by changing that demographic, then you're ruining America. And there there seems to be uh, consensus on both sides that that's true. Uh, The thing is the left wants uh, to change America for one thing, and the right is clinging to this old status quo that uh, which never really existed, but which they believe existed. And I wonder if that's actually going to be true uh, in anything more than just the short term, because as you point out, right, we're already see- starting to see rumblings of some changing patterns in in voting. And this especially, I think, you, you'll see among Hispanics and Asians, uh, especially when the left becomes more hardcore, anti-small business, anti-market, and uh, just against people uh, say, right, they're already enacting policies against Asians getting accepted to fine universities and things like that. So the two components that need to be separated are, A, there's this left-wing plot, which I think the plot exists, the question is, two. The, the second part of that is, though, will the plot succeed or will it attain the goals that the left wants or are the assumptions of the basic plot correct? And I think that second part is less true. And to be fair, like, I, mean, I think that um, you know, someone like Tucker Carlson and, and others that have defended him um, you know, out there would, would, would argue that even that, that, that this is that the immigration concerns and the demographic change in America are not necessarily purely on on you know, Hispanic grounds, that basically the idea is that America has a uniquely pro freedom culture and and that the it, massive Im, immigration, um, your permanent immigration from any other culture out there threatens to undermine that respected value. Um, the problem, of course, is that if you look around right now, I mean, it, it is it is native born Americans, you know, that that seem to be the most hostile to, you know, those, those claimed values right now. And, and that's that's where, like, you know, again, there, there are there is a large percentage of the American population that politically I'd perfectly be fine with replacing their political value, you know, their, their political power with, with a lot of, of people that have actually suffered through uh, the reality of communist regimes. Um but but you know that again, this is this is 
this is the problem, though, is that, you know, trying to have an, an honest conversation about the impact of some of these policies. And of course, it's always, you know, in libertarian circles, the immigration question is always going to be nuanced because, you know, it's that classic Milton Friedman line about, hey, look, if you have if you have immigra- you know, open borders without a welfare state, that's fine. But it, 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 there's, there's ways that you subsidize certain patterns. And Mises talked about the consequences of high immigration levels with an interventionist government, um, you know, using the direct example of like Australia. If they opened their borders to Asian immigrants and the makeup there would change very quickly and, and the, the Australian population would suffer the, con- the, the, the have valid fears at the political ramifications on their population from that. Um, and so, again, I, I think that it is something that the, the, the pro clutching avoids a lot of the, the really important questions here. Uh, which also just kind of includes the, the kind of a, I think a foundational question of you know what exactly is Western civilization in the first place? Because uh, I, I think that's something where if, if we're looking at the underlying values of what made uh, America successful in, in its own right, I think that you know the Ralph Rake, I, I, Ralph Rako's article on on the European miracle and the foundations of Western civilization, you know, as, as having those fund, fund foundational Christian values, I think that's something where you know if we talk about the, the American immigration situation relative to, let's say, some of the issues that are going on in Europe, like right then and there, you have a major cultural dim- difference there that I think is often overlooked with the way that these conversations are typically had. Yeah, let's uh, let's look at Mises, right? Mises, Mises believed in replacement theory, right? <laughs> <laughs> not, but not on racial grounds, right? He his uh, his big concern being from Austria Hungary, I think, was primarily on linguistic grounds because he came from a place right. where he had all these different linguistic groups, and Mises clearly didn't see any real meaningful difference uh, between Slavs, Hungarians, Austrians, and uh, so on in terms of you know some crackpot theory about their IQ or something like that. Mises completely rejected. Uh, polylogism and the idea that some groups of people are incapable of understanding liberalism or something like that. But he did note and uh, admitted freely that different cultural groups uh, tend to center around themselves. That is, German speakers prefer the company of German speakers and Hungarians prefer Hungarians and that sort of thing. In fact, when the Hungarians tried to get independence from Austria, they actually did so in a way where they wanted to be able to subjugate the non-Hungarian speakers around them and so on. And so Mises was, of course, intimately aware of all of this and saw that, okay, you get like a linguistic minority, some sort of cultural minority in one place that's going to want to uh, take over, essentially, and maybe suppress those, those minority elements within the group. And so you can take out the racial element of this and of course, I personally don't <laughs> don't buy the idea that oh no, Mexicans are moving here. They're gonna they're gonna wreck everything. Uh, and and the, the hilarious uh, white genocide theory and so on. Although I'm biased because my father committed race genocide or white genocide, right, by marrying a brown woman. And now all of his uh, inhabitants or all of his descendants are tainted forever. So his children, his grandchildren, they're all they've all been made inferior by their Mexican blood. And, uh, you know, boy, the, if only if only he hadn't done that, I'm sure the McMakins would go down in history forever as a bunch of geniuses. But now uh, that's been ruined. Thanks to his thanks to committing genocide against his fellow whites. So uh, I, uh, you know, that's just an unfortunate thing my family's been burdened with, I guess now. But uh, <laughs> needless to say, not particularly concerned about the racial element of that. But yeah, right. It's uh, replacement theory, especially in the Australian context, was uh, what uh, Mises talked about, and uh, it's hard to really argue, right? Certainly, if you had. Uh, if the Hungarians suddenly doubled in number and all moved into Vienna and so on, this would completely change the nature of Vienna, Vienna, 1910, right? How could anyone argue it would not have? And so that's the basic premise there uh, at work. Um, okay, fine. The, the question is, though, uh, is this something that's uh, as big a problem or as unprecedented as Tucker seems to think it is. And I think if we look at a little bit more historical context there, 
uh, we see that, well, there's really no reason to assume what Tucker uh, assumes is going to happen. And we could just look back in the 19th century, where at that time, most Americans are unaware that the immigration wave of the mid-19th century was just gigantic in terms of Germans, uh, British, and Irish moving to the United States. Now, the later wave of Italians and Eastern Europeans didn't come until the very late 19th century or the early 20th century. But the population uh, was basically replaced during that period. The, the sheer number of immigrants who came in and offered huge, huge uh, alternative ethnically, culturally, to the old guard of the Anglo-Saxons. And, and you saw this then in the conflicts that arose in a lot, and you can see in a lot of the works of Rothbard, this conflict between uh, the old Puritanical uh, Anglos in the Northeast, especially, and these uh, German and Catholic, what, uh, what Rothbard calls the liturgicals in, in opposition to the pietists. This was in many ways a, a cultural and a, a ethnic conflict that occurred, and much of that was driven by immigration. And incidentally, at the time, it was the good guys, the Democratic Party, uh, the laissez-faire party, who wanted more immigration. Because they got all of these immigrants coming in from Central and Western Europe and uh, were changing the face of the party, were moving into these cities and uh, really changing the politics there. But these groups, they wanted independence from the central government, which they viewed as being controlled by these old school Anglos. And it was it, this led to them taking a more free market anti-establishment view. Now, What's claimed now is that the opposite is true, is that immigrants will all take this communistic pro-central government view. And I, I think that's based on this idea that these people vote democratic. And certainly, I think you can come up with some precedent from recent uh, decades to support that idea. The question is, will that always be the case? And why should you assume it? Also, as the point you make, what... <laughs> where are we supposed to get these other immigrants that are supposedly so wonderful? So now let's import Germans and Frenchmen and Englishmen and they'll they'll be good immigrants. Those people are commies. I don't know. I, I'm not sure why that would improve the country, whereas immigrants from other places uh, are significantly problematic. And, and you know, I, I do know that there are various kind of studies on how you know immigration's respect for like say gun rights is is can be lower than a lot of Native Americans and and I, I not not in, in a uh, you know native born American let's put it that way um, but but I, I think what's interesting is that you know one of the things I, and, and I, I, this is where I do think that there are some valid concerns about the consequences of high immigration levels to to America but it's not about immigrants per se, themselves, it's about how the institutions of the United States have been built to actively discourage the sort of assimilation that America had, you know, in the, in the 19th century, right? Because you know, because once you had the, you know, kind of the, and this kind of goes again to, to the, the, the Friedman point, but I think it goes broader to it. Not only do you have the concerns about, hey, you get across this border and you have access to perks like schools and 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 you know certain types of, of you know social safety nets and things like that, uh, but more importantly now I, I think is the institutions of the United States how you know, the, you know for one we've embraced this sort of uh, uh, you know critical race theory sort of structure here so that there is this incentivized uh, a viewpoint on trying to identify how big of a victim you are to the white male patriarchy here in the U.S. And so you see things, I know here in Florida, for example, like um, uh, the, the Cuban population here is politically, and this, this is also kind of one of some of the frustrations we talk about Hispanic voting trends in general, because again, you you you, uh, you, you talk to a Cuban and you simply call him a Mexican, like, you know, you're, you're going to get, that, that, that causes some issues there, right? So like Cuban voting populations here in Florida have typically been a very conservative voting demographic because of their experiences with communism on the island. But of course, then you have, you know, third generation Cubans that, you know, have now have, uh, uh, you know, they're, they're, you know, maybe, you know, their, their you know, grandfather came here, built up something, you know, their father, you know, you know maybe they got a, a, a you, know, you know, certification to be an electrician or a plumber and something like that. And now they are here and they're getting, you know, a, a master's and, you know, the, the women's studies or something like that. 
And, and now you have, again, going through the university system here, you have now created a generation of, Amer- of, of again, Cuban Americans who now have, again, unfortunately, the same sort of viewpoint on American history that white, you know, cosmopolitan, you know, you know, liberal voters here have. And, and so I think that we can't ignore kind of the institutional aspect here that is, is incentivizing a, a, a rejection of that liberal tradition that's always made the West different. Um, but then on the other side of it, you know, what we've seen, and I, I think this is a big uh, reason for some of the, the voting patterns in 2020, is that you know, the left has trans, you know, the Democratic Party has transformed from being simply the, for one, being the, the working class party versus the, you know, Chamber of Commerce Republicans, you know, but they, they really doubled down on culturally left aspects that I think conflict a great deal with, you know, a, a, a larger Christian demographic. You know, I, if, if you look at, you know, the poll, there's, again, so it's a study I've re- referenced a few times now, is the, the Hidden Tribe study that looks into the way that different demographics look at political correctness, look at, you know, transgender rights issues, look at things like that. And, and the people that are most opposed to these things typically are minority voters in the U.S. And, and so, again, I, I think that going back to the actual consequences here, I, it's, it's, it's a mistake to kind of make any assumption that, oh, this is going to end up uh, uh, rejecting a lot of those values. I mean, Christianity itself, as you know, in, the, in the political ramifications they're on in, that's something I don't think the left is really counting on. And I'm interested to see if these voting change, if these voting trends with Hispanic voters continues, how that ends up directly impacting the way the Democratic Party as a political operation ends up trying to view some of this stuff. Yeah, we're looking at so many of these things that we're supposed to revile immigrants for uh, apparently creating uh, the welfare state, um, the uh, the left, the hard left social policies you learn in universities. Well. <laughs> How are immigrants responsible for that? Uh, if you want to, if, if anybody should be replaced, it's these upper middle class, university educated white people who who created all that. It's uh, the the school teachers who taught your kids to hate capitalism. Probably some middle aged baby boomer named Linda or Karen, right? Who gr- went to school in the seventies and is now going to teach these these suburban kids, what's what's true and how to be egalitarian and so on. That's what they come out of high school knowing. Then they go to college and and it gets even worse. I don't see how immigrants caused any of that. And this was often a point that Bill Anderson has made both in writing and in person. He's like, look around you. He's like, who's responsible for progressivism? It's it's wealthy white people. Where did where he's like this, this stuff didn't come from Central American immigrants. They didn't infiltrate the universities and implant this in the ruling class. And so the 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 whole claim is nonsensical. And speaking of California, if you want to look at uh, how voting works in California, a lot of it supports the points you're making. If you want to see the most hard left, most commie part of California, it's the Bay Area. It's not Southern California where you have a bunch of Hispanic immigrants. In fact, when they had that gay marriage proposition on the ballot, Southern California voted uh, in favor of it to prevent gay marriage, which shows you a little bit of the religious leanings of those people. This includes L.A. County. It was around the Bay Area, the, uh, the tech people, Silicon Valley, people like Nancy Pelosi, people who live in big, huge suburban houses and have boatloads of cash, uh, these are the people who are obsessed with uh, making sure gay marriage remains legal. So, uh, again, they're trying to pin all that on the immigrants. It doesn't show up anywhere in the voting patterns, in the politics, in the universities or anything. And, and so the whole underlying narrative, uh, I think, is a bit weak there. And one of the states that uh, on top of California and, and that example that uh, Tucker Carlson looked at directly was the case of Virginia. And, and while, you know, I, I, I have no doubt that, you know, uh, you, you have high immigration levels in the state, but you've, you've also had is a significant increase in the percentage of the college educated population there. And again, this goes to, again, I, I think the larger concerns, again, if you are a, a, an average Republican, then I, I, I think that if, if you are concerned about the, the political transformation of this country, the, and the issue is not the border, it is the university system. And I, it, it, Virginia, I think, for example, has you know, some of the highest, if you look at uh, 
you know, 2000 relative to 20, 2010, 2020, you know, the increase in uh, percentage of the population with college degrees and then perhaps even mo more insidious uh, uh, graduate degrees, because these are people who are not going to the uh, Mises Institute graduate program, which is a, a, a great way of, of avoiding some of the brainwashing of many master's programs out there. Um, you know, but, but those are the people that are really driving the change in Virginia's in politics, particularly, you know, up in North Virginia, which, of course, there you also have the economic structure there, right? You know, you, the you know, post-2008, you know, D.C., Nova area was, was a big boom town at a point where, you know, at a time where, where a lot of the country was not, because that's just the, the, the benefit of being right next to political power, of course. And so, you know, the, the massive increase of the the Washington Beltway economy and all its various facets that tends to attract a certain sort of person, and again, those sort of people don't necessarily have conservative voting patterns, and so that's where you have this this great stark contrast between South and North Virginia. Um, and again, I, and that's why I think that it is it, it does a, a great disservice to to completely you know, avoid you know the, the 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 consequence of immigration on political systems because it it, it it leads to a lot of watered down conversation, failing to appreciate a lot of these, these different things. Because like, you, you talk to someone, I mean, we had some fellows here um, from, from Germany, for example, right? And like I, I, when they talk about how, you know, there's, there's towns in Germany that went from having a population of roughly a thousand people to then having, you know, top down, you know, imposed EU, you know, Merkel agreements to then basically, you know, double the size of the population with immigrants from Syria or some other country, I, I, I think as, as libertarians to simply look at that and say, oh, well, that's no big deal. You know, you know, you know, there's no consequence there. You know, no individual, you know, no, no human is illegal, whatever, you know, all, all of the, the bumper, sticker, bumper sticker sayings out there. I, I think that you do do a misservice to some of the real consequences there, but that's not what you have in the U S per se. Like America, the, the, the I think it's very easy and understandable to look at some of the difficulties that Europe has had, see something that kind of looks similar to here in, in America, and, and then take the wrong conclusions, not understanding that, again, you know, they, they're taking in refugees from, say, Venezuela is not the same as taking people fleeing, you know, war-torn Syria. Like, there, there are consequences here that are, are deeper uh, than simply, you know, all immigration equals X outcome. Well, of course, right. the the mere uh, the mere issue of differences in culture is one thing, right? And I think in this case, then there are uh, people who are obsessed with the whole replacement idea, or that uh, Latin American immigrants are a big problem. And of course, it's important to note that uh, in the modern world, uh, just as if you look at the numbers now, it's it's really immigrants from India and China that uh, are driving a lot of these numbers. It's not even Latin Americans. I think it's easy to uh, attack that group, and they almost never mention the Indians and the Chinese when, the, when they're talking about anti-immigrant policies. I think they like to mention the Latin Americans because they can always throw in the phrase third world. It's third world immigration. It's, these people don't understand anything, and they're violent, and we don't need them, and, and so on. But even then... <laughs> Let's look at the Latin Americans, right? Uh, speak a European language. They're Christians. Uh, in many cases, probably more Christian than the average American, right? Who's generally godless. And so uh, this is very different, as you say, than migration to Africa. Now that the one issue of, yeah, should a small town have imposed from the outside uh, large numbers of new residents. I mean, you, you could argue against that for any type of residence, right? Just from the neighboring province, should you should the central state come in and say, well, I mean, this is what the Soviet Union used to do, right? We're moving these people around. We're moving them to your town. And uh, there's nothing you can do about it. This, this is pretty screwed up central planning. And no matter what context it occurs in, it's pretty bad. And so, yeah, I don't, I don't envy uh, the Europeans where that's occurring. I think that happens less in Switzerland because it's more locally controlled and local communities actually have some say over who lives in their communities and, and a lot less say in places like China and Scandinavia and so on. But yeah, quit, quit uh, just conflating together the notion of people from Libya with people from southern Mexico 
or people from Honduras. I mean, these these are two very different groups, and one is European, uh, essentially, in terms of religion, uh, and there are a lot of elements of, I, they always like to try and play up that these people are essentially Indians straight from the jungle or something like that, but these are people who are well familiar with Western legal systems and so on, even if they don't function that well uh, in many parts of, of Central America and the poorer parts, the more rural parts and so on. But I think a lot of those differences are really played up for effect by uh, people like Tucker, and I'm not sure there's a, that's particularly helpful. And again, gets us back to the issue of, are they really predicting correctly in terms of what's going to happen with these groups over the long term? And we can point to past immigrant groups, right? Eastern Europeans, which 100 years ago were viewed as basically subhuman. I mean, a Polish person and, and someone from southern Italy was not a white person and uh, certainly someone you didn't want in your neighborhood. And those people are all, you know, quote unquote, honorary white people now, right? Like nobody, nobody cares if you have a, an Italian last name or a Polish last name. People used to care a lot about that sort of thing. And that's all just different. Uh, it's all just uh, completely changed. And we, in fact, we can see a lot in the data that by the third generation in, a lot of these groups don't even consider themselves as different. And I've written articles on this, noting that to a certain extent, the census really uh, perpetuates this by creating just out of thin air the idea of Hispanic as a, as a completely separate group, a concept that never even existed prior to the 1970s. You just had, you had people moving in from Latin America, and they were, except for a couple of censuses that tried to distinguish Mexicans as a separate group, they, they weren't even counted as a separate group. But now the census tries to differentiate these people as much as possible. And now we'll, we'll claim that, right, three generations down. So when my grandparents moved here from Mexico, okay, let's see. So they had a daughter who married a white man, and I married a white woman, by, by which I mean non-Hispanic white. And so say, so now according to the census, my children, five generations, my, uh, my descent is five generations from now will also be Hispanics and some sort of separate minority group or so on. We see this also with Asians. By the third generation in, Asians don't really think of themselves as a separate group, although some might, whites, depending on their physical appearance, might uh, uh, treat them that way. But the fact of the matter is intermarriage is significant. About a third of these groups intermarry, Asians and Hispanics especially. You only need a couple generations of that before there's really no distinction. So is, is this forever idea of separateness of oppressed minority going to continue forever? The data suggests that it doesn't, especially since a lot of these quote-unquote foreign groups then adopt American ways, which is actually a bad thing. They've uh, found that right, that Japanese Americans have much, much better diets and health uh, overall than native-born Americans, but three generations in, then they finally become just as fat and unhealthy as native-born Americans. So, <laughs> and then as a group, immigrants are, of course, healthier than native-born Americans because they tend to be just the most uh, active, uh, clever people who leave their country and come here and want to get work and so on. And they're the most physically fit because they can stand the journey and so on. But then they come here and a couple generations later, you know, they're, they're eating Fritos all day like the average American does. And then they're getting heart disease at age 45 and so on. So uh, it seems there's a lot of integration going on. There's a there's a whole lot of uh, people being uh, uh, melded into the American melting pot. If you will, it's the problem is, is that as they do that and they go to American public schools and American universities, they're just being molded into uh, what the left wants. Uh, it, it's built into the system now. It doesn't doesn't even matter what your ethnic background is. And so when people, of course, point out, oh, these these immigrants are ruining America with their left wing views, you always got to ask them, did you did you did you send your kids to uh, public school? Oh, well, y yes, of course. Oh, well. Guess what? You, you're probably doing more for the hard left in America than any immigrant ever did. And that's why I'm interested to see you know, how this, this issue kind of transforms going forward, because I, I, you know, one of the things I, I do think that you're seeing on kind of the American right now is the I mean, I, you know, I, I've been surprised, pleasantly surprised by a lot of the pushback and in, in changes even into like K through 12 education, you know, people looking for, for other alternatives. But, you know, if, if you're a Republican that has been hyperventilating, hyperventilating about the, the immigration issue, if, if you're 
respond, your, your focus right now is not trying to defund those university programs. And that's something that Republicans can do at the national level. They can do it at the, the I mean, obviously there's, you know, the, the votes at the national level aren't going to get clever major wins. They're fine, but it's something you can do at the state level. I mean, every, every, you know, what, you know, Every Marxist in a taxpayer-funded state university is a, pol- is a policy failure for the Republican Party in that, that area, right? Um, if you want to get serious about the demographics' of destiny, tra- political transformation of this country, you know, simply you know, not embracing, not, under- not, not really focusing on the institutional problems that are here. Because I mean, the, the funny thing is, the irony is, is that the, the great uh, bailout of you know, the, the inability of conservative America to have, you know, to, to hold on to any uh, uh, real institutions of power in the U.S. at the end of the 20th century, it could be bailed out by secular leftists embracing this demographic change strategy with immigration, not appreciating the consequences of, you know, Christian values and in, in its long-term impacts on politics. And so, you know, the, the, the greatest victory for conservatives might simply be liberals being disconnected from reality. And, 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 and you know, that's something, again, we, we started to see it in 2020. I'm interested to see if this political realignment continues um, and, and interested to see how the, the populist right like Tucker, perhaps you know, whether there's any recognition there that, again, the, the university system in place, these institutions that we have is a far bigger threat to the you know the, the the American value system than anything that uh, is from outside the borders. Well, we should probably call it a day, uh, <laughs> having covered that. And yeah, I think the, I think the general point is there, right? It's it's not like uh, all bad things in America are coming from the outside. And boy, if it weren't for those immigrants, we would have never come up with the idea of socialism, and uh, we'd all be uh, hardcore capitalists. I mean, clearly uh, that that's not what's going on. And in fact, our Homegrown institutions are are producing plenty of uh, pro socialism youth uh, in America, regardless of where they came from. And so, yeah, maybe we should address some of those issues uh, as well before uh, just uh, uh, forwarding this notion that it's an import from people from faraway places. Hey, one other note, note, note though, is, is that, yeah, this is not kind of a, a blanket defense of, of the system that currently exists, right? I mean, we're, we're seeing right now the consequences of regime uncertainty in the way that it does attract immigrants without a system dealt, you know, built to handle them. And that's, that's, that's why you have the, the massive increase at the border with people in detention centers and things like that. Because, you know, it, it's, it's it, you know, what we have right now is not a, is, is a fundamentally broken uh, uh, immigration system for, from any sort of rational perspective. And so again, it's not sort of a blind defense of everything that's going on right now, but simply highlighting how some of these concerns, you know, they should not be dismissed and simply pushed into, you know, the, the corner. They, they, it, it, it is worthwhile to seriously grapple with them, but the, the, the consequences are not quite what even perhaps the advocates generally believe them to be. Oh, well, the, the, it's so horribly run, right? And then we'll signal to all these people that they should move to the United States. And then when they get here, there's there's nothing set up for processing them properly. We can't be bothered with hiring enough judges or enough facilities to deal with it. And yeah, just what, how should how should we be surprised, right? Just yet another case of government incompetence and inability to deal with the realities of the world and inviting trouble. Uh, this is just, uh, this is what the regime does all day every day. And, and if there's anyone out there, whether it's the right, the left, or even the immigrant libertarian circles is trying to act like any of these issues are, you know, binary, you know, very simplistic things. None of the, you know, that's where you should be skeptical of all of them because it can, these are nuanced topics. And so, so avoid any bumper sticker solutions one way or another. Well, that's certainly good advice. And I think with that good advice, we'll go ahead and wrap up this episode of Radio Rothbard. I thank our listeners for tuning in to this edition. And we'll be back with more in the future, and we'll see you next time.